Well, welcome everybody uh, to today's webinar presented by Jews for a Secular Democracy. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, we are an initiative of the Society for Humanistic Judaism that is mobilizing the Jewish community to advocate for separation of church and state. And today we have a very special presentation called Abortion of the Supreme Court. What might we, what might we expect? <laughs> and uh, it's being presented by Monica Miller, who is legal director and senior, senior counsel at the American Humanist Association's Apignani Humanist Legal Center. Um, she's also executive director of the Humanist Legal Society. Since joining the AHA in 2012, uh, she has vigorously defended the constitutional mandate of separation of church and state by litigating establishment clause cases across the country. She is also um, one of the very few people in the world who has presented arguments uh, to the Supreme Court um, in the Bladensburg Cross case. Um, she's going to answer our questions around what is going on with the court around abortion, what we should expect um, given all of the developments um, off over the last few months, which I'm sure many of you are curious about. Um, I'm sure you all have questions for her. What's going to happen now is I'm going to turn it over to Monica to um, share her presentation um, and her thoughts on you know, what we might expect from the court. In the meantime, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. We're gonna be monitoring those. And then at the end of our presentation, we will have an open Q&A. So please do share your questions in the chat. And if you are tuning in on Facebook and not on Zoom, you can comment there as well and we'll be looking for your questions. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Monica. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you for having me. Um, this is a sort of different audience, um, although perhaps similar, but for me, it's also so, somewhat of a different subject matter because although um, abortion rights affect humanists and, and everyone, and it's no doubt a very strong separation of church and state issue, we're more familiar with being the ones uh, bringing the cases uh, that involve a violation of the First Amendment, not necessarily the right to choose, um, which usually is you know, handled by um, reproductive rights folks um, like Planned Parenthood, but our, our group started getting involved with these cases, of course, because they immediately impact our members and because they uh, violate church state separation in the sense that it's clearly the religious right that is uh, motivated by these arguments, that these um, fetus arguments, fetus are persons kind of arguments are born out of uh, religious animus and um, and, it, and a desire to control women's bodies. Um, and that's why this is such an important constitutional issue. What Roe versus Wade had established in the 70s and reaffirmed is that the, your ability to control your own body, your bodily autonomy is such a fundamental aspect of, of um, having a right that to, um, to infringe upon that is a serious and fundamental kind of violation. And so it shouldn't surprise folks, although I think nowadays it kind of does, to learn that um, originally, if any political side was um, pro-abortion, it was actually Republicans um, it, who were against government overreach and who firmly believe in the right of one's own bodily autonomy. They saw it as more of a social issue or a medical issue, something that should be decided with a, a patient and their doctor and not an issue for the courts to decide because that's not the role of the federal judiciary to decide these issues, they're doctor patient issues. So it, it was actually um, Roe versus Wade was a seven two decision, including four President Nixon appointees that were on the court at the time of Roe versus Wade. So, um, so a lot's changed since the 70s. Um, and a, a sort of a side note, and this might be familiar to some folks, but Nixon also, his administration, I'm not a Nixon fan, but just his administration was the one that rolled out um, environmental legislation, such as the Endangered Species Act, Clean Air Act, and I think the Clean Water Act was also under the Nixon, Nixon administration. So it isn't issues that are now partisan and um, you know, considered progressive or Democrat issues were once non-controversial, you know, Republican supported situations going on. So what we see is the Catholic Church getting involved and religious folks getting involved and really shifting and changing things and creating a political issue where there once was none, or at least not none, but it was not 
the fact that this is being resurrected now when you know 7-2 decision in the 70s and then and that in the 7-2 Roe versus Wade decision was also reaffirmed later in the 90s in the Casey case which I'll get to a little bit um, but that's just sort of some background that I wanted to to lead this off with is the, the constitutional significance where we were with Roe versus Wade and I should also point out that Roe versus Wade was um there really there wasn't really a standard before and so when the Supreme Court issued Roe, they basically said that the woman, she has the right to, to choose up until, you know, maybe the last couple of months once there's actually, um, once, once the fetus can live outside of the womb, more or less. Um, but up until then, it's, you know, between a woman and her patient and her partner and um, all of that. So um, the other thing that's also unprecedented, which I might have alluded to, but is that, that this is the most conservative court since the 1930s. Um, I certainly wasn't around in the 1930s, but this um, this makeup, again, we have four, two, three, I just got the Nixon number mixed up. We have three appointees by president, former President Trump. And those judges, justices that were appointed were appointed because they were like Federalist Society confirmed kind of anti-abortionist. And so um, we all have good reason to be concerned. Now there are three cases, but I'll say two, because it's the Texas case and the Mississippi case, but Texas, there was two cases within the Texas challenges um, that I'm going to discuss. And then um, we'll get into a little bit of like predicted outcomes and what, what people are thinking and how the court might shift. And then um, I'll open it up to questions. So um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is the Texas Abortion Ban Act, um, SB8 is what it's referred to as. And that is the one that went before the Supreme Court um, on November 1st for oral argument at the beginning of this month. And it is the one that generated a big stir when the Supreme Court over a strong dissent refused to halt the ban, sorry, halt the, to stop the bill from going into enforcement, to stop the act from going into enforcement. The Supreme Court had the opportunity to do that and declined to do so, thereby putting into effect one of the most, if not the, I think the most restrictive abortion ban in the country. So, um, so that's alarming. But I'll rewind a little bit. So first of all, Texas is the second most populous state in the country. So we're talking already just in terms of impact of these rulings, an inherently big impact because of the size and population of the state. Um, the Texas bill bans abortions um, after the six week mark, more or less. Um, they this is about 18 weeks earlier than the standard set by Roe. So while it doesn't say six weeks, they talk about a fetal heartbeat. Um, and they calculate this from the date of the person's last menstrual cycle, um, to, which is when the, uh, like from then until when the fetal heartbeat is like detectable. It's kind of, it's, it doesn't make sense medically because it's, it's refuted by uh, doctors, but this is, um, this, is, this is well before a lot of people even know that they're pregnant. This period, the six week period is, um, you know, there's many reasons why people would miss their menstruation cycle. Um, other states that have passed similar legislation that we would consider um, like still well short of Roe versus Wade are more at the 20 week point because um, Roe versus Wade is about the 24 week point. So four weeks is still in, in a gestational context quite a lot of time. Um, so those laws are, are restrictive. Six weeks is like we're, I mean, a clump of cells doesn't be, it's like, we're, we're not talking about a human here. And I, I should also note my other work is in animal rights and we're actually doing personhood cases for certain um, sentient beings. And um, I can tell you like an elephant is a, a lot more rights deserving than a clump of cells at six weeks of human cells. So um, I digress, but just, just to put that in perspective, um, what makes SB8 just, the most disturbing law <laughs> ever is the bounty. The court, they set up, Texas set up a, a structure so that the law would evade judicial review. It wouldn't 
They wanted it so that it could not be challenged in federal court, um, so it wouldn't be halted. So these other statutes, these other states that have passed similar statutes, um, they did not use the this approach, and so their bills were halted by lower federal courts pending, you know, Supreme Court taking this case. So, um, so SB eight is unique because it creates a bounty and deputizes private citizens to um, to like basically like bring a lawsuit against anyone to suspected of performing an abortion on someone uh, after six weeks, and it awards them $10,000 in attorney's fees. Um, the problem with this isn't just like that it creates these lawsuits, it creates a chilling effect on doctors and, and um, patients because out of fear that, that they could be sued. And so they're going to be more conservative and, and might not, you know, for liability reasons, like if you're, if you went to medical school and you did all of the things to become a doctor and to think that that could be threatened by just doing a, a, an abortion that was once completely legal and hoping that the court doesn't overturn Roe. I mean, it's, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I would probably end up continuing to perform abortions because I'm me and I do church state separation litigation, but like, I, I wouldn't expect that to be the norm um, and to be, uh, to, to really want to put yourself on the line because you could end up forfeiting your ability to help so many other people. So again, this is a, putting doctors and patients in an incredibly, and I haven't even gotten to patients and, and the burden that this is putting on them, but um, already is creating havoc in the state of Texas um, without it even having the Supreme Court, you know, rule on the merits yet. Um, so the, the SB8 mandate states that a physician may not knowingly perform or induce an abortion on a pregnant woman if the physician detected a fetal heartbeat for the unborn child or, fa fa or failed to perform a test to detect a fetal heartbeat. And that latter point significant because it's also like, if anyone's watched any documentary on abortion um, clinics and, and or have experienced this, but the notion of showing a pregnant person an ultrasound um, of something is already just a little bit too much. Like it's an emotional process. I, you know, I won't get, I haven't had to, I haven't had to go through this, but I have had friends and it's, it just sounds gut-wrenching to have to then confront, a, 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 and, and then I think a lot of abortion clinics, these fake ones, sorry, I shouldn't say abortion clinics, they're like these pseudo ones that, that end up sort of trapping women. They'll show them false, like falsified ultrasounds. Um, like, I, I wanna say I saw one where they like added a, a, like a face that didn't exist on this clump of cells. And like, it was it was something horrific on a documentary I watched. But um, anyway, the long and the short of it is that even just, even if, even just putting liability in a statute to for doctors to fail to perform a test for this fetal heartbeat um, is, is, is upsetting. Um, so th basically then under Texas law, a woman has about two weeks to recognize her condition, confirm the pregnancy with a test, and then make a decision about how to manage her pregnancy or obtain an abortion. Um, it does not make an exception for rape or incest. There's like one narrow, narrow, narrow exception for whether um, if like allow, it allow the termination only if the pregnancy could endanger the mother's life or lead to substantial and irreversible impairment of a major bodily function. So basically like the mom has to be near death or the, or the baby, or sorry, but the, I don't have a good word for this right now. Clump of cells is what I, the fetus. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, so no rape or incest exception is our, again, a really big um, issue because this law is already in place. Um, it's already happening. So the justice department filed their lawsuit against Texas in, September after Judge Abbott signed the bill. And um, because of this bounty scenario, because it's being enforced by private citizens rather than state actors, the issue that came up to the Supreme Court that we heard arguments for earlier this month ended up being procedural issues um, centering on this doctrine that says that, that um, the, the federal courts can't direct state 
courts to do certain things. Like that's just not part of how the federal courts see themselves operating. So um, a lot of the oral argument really just centered on stuff that fell outside of abortion law, but that, and that was by design. That's what Texas wanted was a situation where it would make it really, really difficult to challenge this law. Um, and so on September 1st of this year, the Supreme Court was asked by the Justice Department to enjoin to stop the enforcement of the law pending the Supreme Court ruling on the Texas case or the Mississippi case. Um, and the Supreme Court 5-4, um, which included uh, in the five block, obviously included the three Trump appointees, um, they voted against the request to stop the bill. And this is, again, just uh, is alarming and telling because usually the court would want to maintain the status quo. And when the status quo is the precedent that it had set for decades you know, prior, and it's so subtle that you can kind of go into a grocery store and be like, do you know Roe versus Wade? I can't say that about a lot of First Amendment cases, but everyone knows Roe versus Wade. It's a settled right in our country. And um, so for the court to allow a state as big as Texas to currently be violating that precedent by a statute that just so clearly violates that precedent is, um, is already bad. So it's like already bad. Now maybe the court will flip over, but, um, and I'll, 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 I will say that after that September 1st decision um, and Justice Sotomayor issued a very good dissent and, um, and had noted that the, the law's novel design basically suspended all abortions in Texas because of this chilling effect as well. Um, that Justice Alito did give a presentation or talk or something to Notre Dame, maybe law school. Um, I think I have this in my notes. I, I can be more specific with what he said. But after being criticized by the media and everyone for not banning SB8 and, you know, the fair interpretation is a, that they have basically nullified Roe versus Wade in Texas, um, Justice Alito, I guess, set the record straight and said, no, we didn't. That's ludicrous. Um, just because we didn't, you know, issue this injunction that has nothing to do with how we're going to rule in Roe versus Wade. So for Alito, who, you know, is Alito, uh, very conservative, um, to, to kind of, to kind of say that, I think whether he, whatever kind of pressures he was feeling, whatever, motivated that clarification. I was a little relieved, I have to say, to see that just because at least he cares enough about some image that he wants to look fair and impartial. I'm not sure what the reasons are, but at least it tells us that he's not standing up there saying, I'm going to rip down Roe versus Wade. Um, maybe there's other audiences he's saying that to in private, but at least um, in this other speech he gave publicly, he made that statement. So take with it what you will. But right now, currently in Texas, there is there is a, a, a law that violates Roe versus Wade and it's being enforced and it's active. So um, that's not good. Um, the oral arguments on November 1st, earlier this month, like I said, they were centering on this procedural issue of whether the law's private enforcement structure um, prevents federal courts from intervening to strike it down and whether the federal government is even allowed to sue the state to try to block it. Um, I listened to some podcasts I, that from legal experts more um, immersed in these abortion issues. Um, I read a lot about you know, the court's leanings and even folks like Nina Totenberg do not know <laughs> one way or the other. And in fact, I think it was Nina Totenberg at NPR who even said anyone who claims that they know or predict how the court's gonna, you know, strongly predict how the court's gonna rule on the Texas case. And frankly, the Mississippi case that I'll get to is um, like, she's like, no, like it just, it, she, she said it just so unpredictable. And I, I think Nina's um, given her experience in at NPR and covering Supreme Court cases and um, her opinion means a lot to me. So I felt better not being able to come up with like a really clear picture of um, how, cause I walked away from those listening to those arguments on November 1st, just scratching my head. Um, 
I will say the ju the justices didn't seem very persuaded by the gov the U.S. government's arguments. Um, I forget the woman, the attorney general's name, but in in the podcast that I was listening to also agreed that um, there were aspects of her argument that were not they didn't seem to be is receptive to. But I would also add that they didn't necessarily seem that receptive to all of Texas's arguments either. So. It just based on the arguments, it's difficult um, to see where the court would go. Um, now we also have the Mississippi um, case, which is um, which at least it's not in in effect right now, but it is just um, also concerning. I'm just looking for the first page of my notes on this one so I don't want to get it wrong. Okay, so the name of this act is the Gestational Age Act, but we know the case as Dobbs, um, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And I should add that the AHA, uh, American Humanist Association, along with a lot of other of our religious and secular allies filed amicus briefs in both of these cases. Um, the Jackson Women's Health Organization, there's a really good documentary called Jackson, I think. Jackson and um, about the, the, the abortion clinic. And I think it might've even been in that one where they talked about using, like the abortion clinic was talking about how the fake abortion clinics were using like fake ultrasound pictures and stuff. But if you wanna, if you wanna do a deep dive, um, reversing Roe and Jackson are two to check out. Um, so this case takes aim at Roe versus Wade directly. Um, and whether states can bar um, abortions prior to a fetus becoming viable, which means to live outside of the womb. Um, the same firm, the, the Center for Reproductive Rights, is representing both um, the Texas and Mississippi abortion providers in those cases. Um, the court is slated to hear the Mississippi oral arguments um, on December 1st. And so this law, was passed in 2018. And I think folks probably remember seeing headlines around that time um, where Mississippi passed this, this law that was clearly in violation of Roe versus Wade. It banned most abortions after 15 weeks, which was which is still very, is a lot earlier um, than the Roe versus Wade 24, um, 22, 24 weeks. Um, the only exception the Mississippi law had was for medical emergencies as well. And it did not make an exception for rape or incest, just like the Texas one. Um, the penalty is not the same for um, Texas. It is enforced by the state. Um, and if doctors perform abortions outside of the parameters of the law, they will have their medical licenses suspended or revoked and be subject to additional penalties and fines. Um, but those would presumably go to the government, those fines and not to a private anti-abortion protester who, you know, <laughs> goes and rats out the, uh, the bounty thing is just, it's so, it's, it's um, very Margaret Atwood, Hammond's, Han, Hammond's, can't talk, Hammond's tale. Um, yeah, all of this stuff has my brain just like, what? <laughs> um, so the Mississippi, Miss, the state of Mississippi asked the court to overturn Roe versus Wade they called it egregiously wrong. Um, the lawyer for the government said, the con for Mississippi said, the conclusion that abortion is a constitutional right has no basis in text, structure, history, or tradition. Um, I should add that, I think I said this, but Jackson's Women's Health Organization is the only licensed abortion facility in Mississippi. So, um, so, with 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 that one abortion clinic, um, if they're shut down, there's no more abortion clinics in the state of Mississippi. Um, the good news, the slightly good news anyway, is that this this statute was already blocked. This it's currently blocked by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, which had ruled. And the Fifth Circuit is very conservative. Like the Eleventh and the Fifth Circuit Courts of Appeals are the two most um, conservative leaning, and so even to the Fifth Circuit in 2018, it was like, no, this violates, Roe, this violates Casey. Casey was the 1992 decision that um, said that states can enact pre-viability abortion restrictions um, as long as they don't, they don't create an undue burden on a woman's access to abortion. 
And so in the ruling, the court said, in an unbroken line dating to Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court's abortion cases have established and reaffirmed a woman's right to choose an abortion before vi viability. Um, the court added that the states may regulate abortion procedures prior to viability so long as they do not ban abortions. And they said that this law at issue is a ban, this Mississippi, the, the law in question. So, um, so the Supreme Court did agree to take on this case. Um, and the, um, what was I going to say? The other states that have laws that are not going before the Supreme Court, but that will be um, immediately affected by the rulings because they have similar laws are Georgia, Mississippi, Kentucky, and Ohio. All of those ones have um, heartbeat laws, which I think they ban abortions um, at, I think some of those ban them at six weeks as well, but they don't have the bounty. On the other hand, Florida did enact a statute that, or at least has a bill, I don't know if it's gone into, I don't know if they passed it yet, um, that does create an authorization for private, a private civil cause of action for violations of it. So there is a private mechanism. Um, when are we expected to hear the decisions after the arguments? We, they would be due by next, by the end of June of the coming year but um, they could issue them sooner. And hopefully with regard to Texas, uh, short, they do, because again, um, the law is already um, uh, an issue. I wanna get into a couple of those points about what is what those implications are. Um, yeah. Okay, so the implications for this, the Texas statute being in place right now, but also what will happen if the court overturns Roe versus Wade. Um, with Texas alone, the abortion providers um, have estimated that 85% of patients seeking abortion are at least six weeks pregnant. So like already, like most people coming in, it, like I mentioned, they, they don't even know they're pregnant at that ripe six week mark. Um, there are 7 million, 7 million women of childbearing age in Texas alone. Um, a lot of these are teenagers. A lot of these are low-income people. Um, it costs about $550 for the procedure. And that's, that's excluding travel costs now. Folks have to go out of the state. 70% um, of abortions in Texas in 2019 were provided to women of color. So it just massively disproportionate has a massively disproportionate effect on, on, on people of color, undocumented women. Um, Sotomayor said the state's gambit has worked. The impact is already catastrophic. She didn't say already, but she said the impact is catastrophic because it is already. Like this is, the, the lack of the court banning it is just, it's so bad. Um, so, you know, she, she added patients who have the means have fled the state, traveling hundreds of miles to access basic care, and those without the means have been forced to carry pregnancies against their will. I can't even imagine being put in that position of already being so poor, you can't afford the procedure, you can't afford to leave, and you're now forced to bear a humongous burden that you didn't want, and especially if that was because you were raped. Um, which the law makes no exception for. So it's, 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 yeah. Um, what do, what, what, how do we see these cases going? So the optimistic post hearing Alito make that statement. Here's the Alito speech. I knew we put it somewhere in my notes. Uh, I don't normally work with notes and I didn't want to do a PowerPoint because I knew it was going to be a later presentation and they can be kind of stale, but because this is all new stuff that's kind of evolving as, the days go on. I wanted to make sure I had some um, of the actual quotes in here. So Alito said, put aside the false and inflammatory claim that we nullified Roe versus Wade. Uh, we did no such thing at, and we said so expressly in our order. So I'm hoping that's a signal that, that the court will maybe uphold Roe versus Wade and maybe, you know, at, my, I think the most likely best case scenario is that Roe versus Wade gets upheld, but then they, we see some, a lot of dicta um, sort of side conversations, um, language in there that could be 
taken later to basically to basically signal for a future um you know overturning of Roe versus Wade and maybe a severe you know restriction maybe instead of um the 24 weeks maybe we see a compromise of of I don't know 12 weeks I mean that's that's why it's it it doesn't make sense because it it would this is a medical issue. These are just, these are not issues for judges to guess and decide. And okay, we'll we'll split the difference. Twelve weeks. You know, this is um, it. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I think that we could probably count Amy um, as someone that would would overturn Roe because I think she said as much in in her um, pre appointment speeches. Um, but well, that doesn't mean justices always go and do the things they said. In fact, I think if we look at what happened with um, the Casey case in the 1990s, um, Sandra Day O'Connor had been appointed because they, it was around the time when the court started to get more um, politicized and she was expected to rule against abortion um, because that was, that was maybe she, I forget if she had said something or if that was just known based on um, party lines or what, but she took a lot of Republicans by surprise when she did not vote to um, overturn Roe. And so we might see we might see a shift in judicial opinions. We might see some surprises. Um, we might see the court we might see the court overturn the Texas law, um, which would which then in turn rather or sorry I think I flipped that if we if they overturn the Mississippi law then the Texas law would necessarily be unconstitutional but I don't know how the court would decide the issue of whether they can even reach the issue because of the whole private mechanism thing so um I'm trying to see if there's anything I wanted to add before we get into questions but those are the sort of the overview um and Sort of where people are predicting the court will go, which is basically that we don't know, <laughs> and um, we're hoping for the best but preparing for the worst kind of thing. So yeah, if we want to open it up for questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Monica. We already do have a number of questions in the chat, so I will start with those. Um, this is an interesting one. Um, someone asked, you know, the point around bodily autonomy. They asked, you know, how does that square with the fact that suicide is against the law? That's a good question. Um, I think suicide being against the law is, is almost it's an it's almost kind of like a like a moot point because you can't really enforce that. Um, and I don't know. I know that it's unless you're thinking of physician assisted suicide, I guess that must be the question. Um, because otherwise it's like, well, okay, I'm dead. You can't really put me in jail. But with regard to physician assisted suicide, I'll say that there's they've the states where it's been not allowed, they they usually do some sort of like workaround, like here's a bag with the pills, you know, like I I, I there's some good documentaries on it, but I don't I can't really speak to the ins and outs, but I will say that the chilling effect on physicians is profound and that I think there's a big, um, I think there's more consensus in the medical community about physician assisted suicide and how it's an ethical and humane thing, but the um, laws haven't caught up with that. So in a lot of ways there's, there's parallels, um, but this is different because we're talking about, you know, women being forced to carry to term a child and, and then presumably raise the child. And if you're already poor and you're trying to save money to go to school or, or to get ahead in life, you're now doomed. You're, I think, um, I think you, it was even, um, what's her name? Gloria Steinem, I think one of her sort of she, I don't think she, she, she said that, that the doctor, I think it was Gloria, a famous feminist whose abortion, like, she's like, I wouldn't be doing all this. Like, I wouldn't be Gloria Steinem if it wasn't for my abortion. Like I would be back raising a child. So, um, and she probably already had means she was attractive and all this, like in, in a citizen and she didn't have to work as hard as someone that's coming from, um, you know, Mexico or somewhere else and now having to raise a child and having no means to do so. Um, 
it's it's unfair. It's completely unfair. And I'm sure there's plenty of wealthy <laughs> Texans that are going to are going to be able to just even if they're Republican, it doesn't affect them. Okay, I'll just go fly to my place in Mar-a-Lago and go to my I don't know California maybe because abortion will probably be illegal in Florida soon enough. Um, but yeah, I I don't. Um, it's it's incredibly unfair, and I think that alone kind of changes the dynamic because the suicide stuff more equally affects folks, but this is really um, disproportionate against, you know, from a gender standpoint, from a race standpoint, from an income standpoint, from immigration standpoint, just completely unfair. I would also just quickly add, and I'm not sure the person who asked that question, assuming that they were talking about um, medical aid in dying, mm -hmm. um, which is another word for physician assisted suicide, but generally the medical aid in dying community avoids using that term because they, they, you know, folks who are in that position who typically have a terminal illness with six months or less to live, it's not that they want to die, right. it's not that they lack a will to live, it's just that they're facing unbelievable suffering and want to have some control and autonomy at the end of their life. Um, and, you know, what's really interesting is that the folk, the, the same kind of religious conservative movement um, players that are behind making, trying to make abortion inaccessible and illegal are also uh, right there every time there's any uh, state considering passing medical aid and dying laws um, mm -hmm. because it's part of their, you know, so-called pro-life agenda. Um, and so I think in that way, like you were saying, Monica, there is a parallel there where, um, you know, it isn't respectful of bodily autonomy because certainly if you are, you know, have a cancer that is going to take your life in six months or less and you're going to have unbearable suffering, um, you should really have the, you know, I would argue, um, this isn't necessarily the position of Jews for secular democracy, but I do know it's pretty well supported among a lot of secular folks um, that you should have that option. Um, and it's for the same reasons that a lot of secular folks support access to abortion. That is your body um, that, and, and your choice isn't affecting other people. And it's the state, you know, basing, um, uh, the law on religious dogma on, you know, in one case where life begins and in, in one case, you know, how they think life should end, right? Um, and people have different personal beliefs according to their own conscience. So I do think there's a parallel there. Totally. Um, another question for you um, is, if the ban is allowed to continue, um, will doctors and medical assistants be required by law to report to law enforcement a case where a woman has tried and uh, to um, or, or tried to do an abortion on her own, um, mm. or they said perhaps through abortion pills or you know any other sort of way? Is that one of the implications of this, or is it just the folks who you know take advantage of the bounty for the eating and abetting? That's a good question. Um... I, I don't think, I don't think so. I don't think it, I don't think it's operating against the woman. Um, but you know, no, it is, it is. Uh, it's sorry. It, it, it's for anyone who aids or, and abets a procedure. So that's a, that's a broad, that's intentionally broad. I mean, that's really anyone, <laughs> like anyone who is, uh, performs or aids and abets a procedure. That's nurses. That's, um, I guess the patient, I, like, it's almost hard to like, take it seriously because it's so bad, but we have to take it seriously. Um, yeah. And I, I, I have to, I have to hope that not all of this would be upheld by the Supreme court. Like I have to think that if I don't think, I don't think that the bounty thing is going to continue because that just is like so unprecedented from like every other kind of standpoint. Um, we don't, and especially because it's design, because the design of this was to get around the court. Like it's one thing if this was a really old law, and they've always had this tradition of um, giving private citizens the ability to bring these kind of lawsuits. But even the court during the oral arguments was recognizing the like very novel nature of this setup and the and the design of it to be for. It was almost it was almost understood by everyone in the courtroom that this was the reason for the bounty was to get it not in the court's hand. So, yeah. So um, an another question just in, in terms of, you know, action, right? You know, this is all pretty sobering. Um, and so, you know, 
what can advocates do at the state or at the local level with the understanding that we don't really know how the court will rule? So what's the best way to direct energy at the state and local level in the face of what might happen? Yeah, and honestly, Sarah, like you might even be somewhat more fit to answer the like the state, the federal, the, like the legislation stuff, because I can only tell you that the court is a cluster. Um, but uh, but what I yeah, I think I think that um, I think there's a lot of really good groups that are helping, like helping just direct. Like if you personally have money to give to help, like with the women that need transportation and getting those people like on the ground right now you know, services, like there's, there's organizations that are doing stuff like that. But as far as policy goes and lobbying, um, you know, honestly, all I can say is keep supporting our groups that are doing that. Like, like, do you have specific suggestions, Sarah? Because I have none. Yeah. And I guess before I, I give some, I, I guess a way to rephrase the question is, let's say the worst case scenario well, in the worst case scenario, right, that abortion is just illegal everywhere, right, or by by nature of, well, I guess, let me start with that. So if in the worst case scenario where this is upheld, we're going to see a lot of states replicate it, but not every state will, right? So, um, you know, what what does the court in the worst case scenario and then maybe the less bad scenario, what is left that states would even be allowed to do mm -hmm. given those kinds of rulings? Because that's where I can kind of give yeah. some ideas, but you know, there's certain things that, you know, depending on what the court leaves room for legislatively, yeah. there might not even be something to do depending on how far reaching it is. So can you yeah. give us a sense of that? Sure. So I think maybe a silver lining here is I, I the court, as far as I'm concerned, can't say like that states have to ban abortion at six weeks. What they'd be saying is that states maybe can't, like can, but I, I still think six weeks is just, they're not gonna, I, I can't imagine them confirming, affirming that one, maybe the Mississippi one, which I think was, was I forgot the weeks, but either they're both bad and I can't imagine them upholding something that doesn't have a rape or incest um, exception. I think that though, if, if they get into it and they don't just affirm. Um, uh, so, so that being said, there's most likely still going to be states that choose not to do a six week ban, even at the worst case scenario, which is the court overturning Roe and allowing states to enact these. I don't see, for instance, California or Oregon or um, probably New York, you know, we, we can name the states um, doing that. So my guess is that in the states, so the states that don't have those bans, um, probably making it, you know, legislation could be focused on making it easier for out of state res uh, out of state folks and undocumented folks to get abortion services, um, making sure there's no barriers for those. Um, Cause I can imagine like, you know, being in that really intense point in your life and then, okay, I have to go to another state and then go figure out how to, you, you know, like get medical care from another state. So I think maybe making, it easier um, in those states, as far as the states that will, you know, red states, we'll just have to say, um, that's where lobbying efforts could also be amped up to at least encourage like less draconian laws. And, and if the court in the worst, worst scenario says, um, you know, you can even, you know, not make, ex you can not make exceptions for rape and incest. You can do all these things like maybe lobbying efforts can at least be focused on trying to make those really those bad laws like somewhat less bad. So, okay, push for at least get, at least have some exceptions here that aren't just for like, if the woman or the ba the, the fetus is going to, to die. I would, I would just echo what you said around making it as easy as possible in that, you know, bad scenario where, you know, states are allowed to severely restrict or outright ban abortion um, that, you know, we would, if you're in a state where it's uh, really supportive of abortion, you know, trying to make it as easy as possible, especially if they're bordering a state exactly. um, that that outlaws it to really have the state go from, okay, you can, if you can get here, you know, yeah. you can get, you can get an abortion, but at, and facilitating to the, as much as it possibly can, yeah. um, even like the that. populations that are disadvantaged. As you were saying that, I was just thinking like having like, I don't know, maybe this is already in existence, but like airports like could have that, you know, so it's like you don't even have to like leave, you know, or somewhere like around airports, like where like a, hotels could, you know, use like, I don't know all the equipment and stuff, but I imagine they could do mobile clinics. 
I mean, I think they already have mobile clinics for sure, but like they could station them more at airports. But yeah, there's definitely gonna, it's it's just, it's such a sad state of affairs to have to imagine a country so divided that we're gonna have half the country allowing women to exercise their right, or, or I guess we can't call it a right anymore, but the, to have it's a human right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah right. Like a, to have their bodily autonomy recognized and affirmed. Uh, and in the other half of the states, women are not, or, or pregnant uh, menstruating people are not recognized as the full beings. A clump of cells gets to trump that if you're raped. <laughs> There are, I'm going to kind of combine these questions. Um, the, the question is, um, is, is there a way that you could see the court sort of just sidestepping the whole question of abortion altogether and just deciding on sort of the vigilantism aspect and kind of kicking the can down the road? And if so, like what, because we've seen the, the court kind of on other religious freedom cases sort of kick the can down the road and not really make a decision or make a really narrow decision. What, what, what could that look like? It's hard to say because because um, we're dealing with like actual statutes. So it's not like the court can, I mean, the court can, they, it would have to sort of strike down certain aspects. So it's hard to sidestep. It would be hard to sidestep the Mississippi one, for instance, where they've asked the court, like that's one of the questions before the court. Um, so if they affirm, if in the Mississippi case, if they decide to rule on that one first, then, and they say we're affirming Roe versus Wade, they might just, they might evade, they might sidestep all of Texas altogether and say, we're affirming Roe on this nice clean Mississippi ground. And then Texas, uh, you're gonna have to match up with what we just said. So I don't know. Um, I don't think it would even, if they sidestep it, it's, I don't even know what that would look like because we're gonna just continue to see this cycle. So um, yeah, I mean, I would hope that, that, that's, that there, people are talking about that. I just don't, I don't think we know what that looks like because it's, it doesn't really, it doesn't naturally come out of the facts that we're looking at. Like, how can you sidestep that issue in the Mississippi case where they passed the law in 2018? So the question is, is the law allowed to go on or not and I don't know how they can say like I said earlier I do think that they'll they can't sidestep it but they might sidestep like the full picture and say we're striking down the no exception but that's still that's still effectively overturned Roe because if they're saying that you can ban abortion at anything short of you know like I, the the you can live outside of the womb um then that's an overturning so I'm going to ask another question from the chat and then I'll let Paul have the last question. Um, so this is kind of asking you to get in the head of Christian nationalists, but I think, you know, since you, uh, you know, work on this stuff every day, um, you might have some insight. So um, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but I do think it's, it's helpful to get a sense of like, what comes next? What is the agenda here? Um, this question is, what do you think Christian nationalists want to achieve by restricting abortion? Like, will they be satisfied with if they get it legally banned? Um, so what, what is next? What is, you know, mm -hmm. what's your insight into the minds of the Christian nationalist agenda here? We could, sometimes we feel like we understand it, but then things just completely defy it. And when, again, like knowing that this originated from Republicans that, um, were in favor of autonomy, to have this shift is a, is a, a testament to, um, to like messaging and media and the church. And um, I really do recommend the Netflix documentary Reversing Row because they get in, they try to get into some of the motive and understanding it better because what we do, we, we don't really understand like the motive. If you go into those ministerial exception cases where the court is siding with like the Catholic, you know, school, but over a Catholic teacher. So they're like not actually favoring like religious like worshipers. They're favoring like the religious institutions. And that's a big difference. And they're not protecting the religion, they're protecting the institution. So you have to think like I think power is really what's at play here and maintaining and keeping power in the hands of the Catholic Church, in the hands of those select, you know, the Federal Society folks. I, I have to think it's just seriously, like personally, personal to them and the per like they personally gain from it. Like the folks that are like pushing it and then everyone else is just thinking that this is what their religion 
requires or is beneficial to their religion to be pushing for. And they're not, you know, thinking they're just following their leaders. So um, the motives are um, really hard to understand because we can all, we all here understand the hypocrisy of pro-life and the same folks that are pro-life are the same folks that are pro-gun, are the same folks that are anti-welfare, anti-helping the anything that comes out of a womb. So um, it's just, um, yeah, what's next is I encourage you to watch Handmaid's Tale. <laughs> that's, like, that's all I can think of is I picture us all wearing red robes <laughs> under his eye, I, you know, praise be. I, I can't think of what, what happens after if the court allows for Texas's statute to to um, stay and then you know other states to adopt it. I think you hit the nail on the head with power. Uh, that's that's a good answer, um, Paul. I'm going to let you have the last question before we close out. Sure, and thank you, Monica. This has really been helpful and fascinating. And hi, everybody. Paul Golden, Jews for Secular Democracy and Society for Humanistic Judaism. And the piece I wanted to bring into it is the Jewish angle because um, you know, when you look at where the Jews are politically in the US, overwhelmingly are liberal. Um, Orthodox Jews tend to be conservative. These are broad strokes. Um, and humanists, as a, a humanist myself, um, I don't consider humanism a religion, but we're kind of categorized as a religion according actually to the courts, right? So. My question is kind of how can religious people, including um, non-theistic religions like humanistic Judaism or um, hu folks who are members of American Humanist Association, which is a great organization for the humanistic Jews who are on this call who may not yet be a member of AHA. We're not mutually exclusive, you can do both. Um, but even for religious Jews or, or liberal religious Jews, you know, I am not a lawyer, but I read the Roe v. Wade decision and it mentions Jews and it mentions other religions. And it basically says, because there's no agreement right. among different religions in America, by making a decision based on a religious perspective, that's a, a breach of the First Amendment, and we can't do that, and therefore abortion needs to be legal. And how do you, so two part questions, so, and this was asked earlier in the chat too, like how do these judges justify making that decision based on their own religion? And you argued a case where it was a gigantic cross that is now government funded because they think it's a secular symbol. Um, how do they, how do you get into that mindset? But I think more importantly, how do we argue the case as religious minorities? Because that's yeah. what we are, whether we are humanists or Jews in this country, we're a religious minority whose rights are being trampled because they're basing these decisions on somebody else's religion. Yeah, that's a great question. And honestly, like, because you represent the Jewish side of things. That's actually an upper hand in this. Um, the reality is the federal courts care less about atheists and it is, it, and we're, you know, humanism is a religion in a legal fiction kind of way more so, but, but Judaism, even though secular Judaism is somewhat, it can, you know, has its arms and all the, the things, it still is, as everyone understands it, religion. And to say that the Jewish faith sees viability at a different point in time than the Catholic faith and that this faith is a very powerful statement and is precisely why Roe and the, and the lawyer who argued in Roe said, you know, every religion does define this differently. And that's, you know, are we going to leave it up to the courts or are we going to leave it up to the religions and the doctors and the patients and everyone else? And so um, I think making that voice amplified and heard the Jewish voice of when maybe there's no set, you know, viability point. And that's, that's the point, you know, like whatever it is, I think that that is an incredibly important message um, that couldn't be understated, you know, as far as like, because a hundred percent when we think of like, oh, it's just religion, they're rubber stamping. Well, it's no, it's one particular, you know, Catholic religion, maybe, um, you know, the South has their stuff, but it's, not everyone's religion. And so I think making that clear, because it's a little harder when you're sort of in the pure atheist category um, 
to make those claims because they just seem a little less genuine. I'll also add that there's some creative, um, I'm not sure if I agree with all of the aspects of the litigation, but the Satanic Temple is um, involved with trying to make affirmative religious statements in favor of abortion. Um, I wouldn't recommend like mix, mixing the Jewish message in with the Satanic Temple message just because that won't help, but for the Jewish folks, but like there, I think that the creative aspect of that, and there's probably other religions that might be able to make similar arguments too, um, that for, for a right to have an abortion as, as protected by their religion. So, um, you know, they have to be, and I think the courts, I think the court is aware that there's a pendulum. I don't think they're always seeing it. And then if you're, if anyone's interested in reading my latest 11th circuit court brief, I actually get right into all of this stuff about how, um, when the court recognized the Bladensburg cross as a secular symbol, they're harming religion because now the satanic temple came along and they held a huge dedication ceremony at the cross and they rededicated it as the satanic Bladensburg temple cross. And they had all these people there, Christian protesters. And I just thought it was great. I, you know, like they co-opted the cross because the the Supreme Court told them to. They said the cross is just as much your Satanist as it is the Christians, like sort of tongue in cheek because the Supreme Court knows a cross is a religious Christian symbol. But at the same time, now it's everyone's symbol, um, weakening religion and weakening the Christian faith specifically. Um, so I do think those um, pro-religion arguments should be stated that are not consistent with you know, Catholic religion. Thank you. We should let folks know that the Satanic Temple does not actually worship Satan. No, so you, you, you should you should check them out. They're they're non-theistic, but their approach is basically to troll the folks who want to enforce their religion. And so, for example, like the tent, they they put up a, a, a statue of Satan anywhere there's a Ten Commandments in a courthouse because basically the rule the ruling that lets them put the Ten commandments there is that we allow religion to, you know and so they want to put their satan yep. statue and inevitably both come down right because they don't want the same statue there so then they take down the 10 commandments and it's just a, it's a different approach than than we take but um it's a brilliant approach and uh, i think we need as many weapons in this fight as we can possibly get exactly well, with that closing question, I want to thank Monica so much for presenting to us today. Um, a lot um, that we learned, a lot to be uh, concerned about, but if anything, uh, this should reinvigorate your support for organizations like Jews for Secular Democracy and the American Humanist Association, and uh, a reminder that you can get involved with us. Uh, we are doing some great work in Florida and New York and Michigan, and we can also start cohorts in your state um, and work on this issue. If this is the thing that motivates you, I know a lot of us are certainly motivated by what's happening at the courts, which means we really need to be active at the state and local level um, to support uh, access to abortion. Uh, so thank you, Monica, again. Thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Take care, Thanks, everyone. Thank you for having Take me. Take care. Bye-bye.